Hello, everybody, and welcome to Eight Simple Steps, the LinkedIn Live series. We're also streaming on YouTube and Facebook this evening. And uh, this is our weekly Why Are You an Entrepreneur series, where I bring in the most successful rock star entrepreneurs from all over the globe. And tonight is no exception. But before I introduce my rock star, who is here to give you amazing wisdom on entrepreneurship, I want to just introduce myself. I'm Maureen Edwards. I'm the founder of 8 Simple Steps, where I work to eliminate the overwhelm and the real complexity of either building a business, uh, managing a business, scaling a business. I want you to thrive and survive in a sea of competitors. And I have a proprietary blueprint that does it all in eight simple steps. And I guide you every step of the way. So if you wanna learn more about that, you can go to eightsimplesteps.net. But I wanna move on now and introduce somebody who I've met now for a couple months. Uh, again, met through Clubhouse. That seems to be a common theme. Mm -hmm. But Donna Bender, she is the president and CMO of the Donna Bender Company. And she has quite a story on entrepreneurship. And we kind of feel like, I think, sisters from the past because we both started in corporate, then became entrepreneurs. And so Donna, welcome. Thank you so much, Maureen. I greatly appreciate the opportunity and time to chat with you. Well, I appreciate um, you showing up tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. you for doing this. So. Uh, you know, I specifically like sought you out for this because I thought you were really perfect about sharing your entrepreneurial journey with others who are also on the same journey. They could be just starting. They may be struggling. Uh, they may need to hear from people like you to have some inspiration and certainly pick up some tips, tricks, insights uh, that can help them be successful. And I, I think this is the reason why we partner together to do this. And so I would like you to share just a little bit about your corporate background and then how and why did you transition into owning your own company? Well, um, my whole corporate background also started as a, um, a, a fluke because I majored in speech pathology and wanted to get a job in the public schools. So um, that my whole career was just like, what? Um, so. I started my career, I, I was working for Calvin Klein and I started as a salesperson and over the course of nine years, worked my way up to vice president of merchandising for two of his companies. Wow. And it gave me um, an unbelievable education as to, you know, how to brand, how to build a business, how to build relationships. And it, it really was an amazing, amazing experience. And, you know, then as time moves on, um, there's only certain places you can go in a company. And someone else who was a vice president at Calvin Klein uh, went to Salvatore Ferragamo to run the U.S. And he asked me if I would mind coming on board to run the women's division. And I was like, yeah, OK. And so... Um, I immediately jumped in and within like three or four days had to go to Italy and did not speak Italian and would sit in meetings and just like, you know, had no idea if they were talking about bubblegum or or fashion apparel, or apparel. Yeah. And um, but that was an, a wonderful experience as well. And I got to see, you know, Calvin Klein was an American uh, a designer, fashion designer, celebrity, the Ferragamos, I always say, were like royalty. They were just so well known and they were regal. They, it was the mother who was the matriarch of, of the family and seven siblings all ran the company when Salvatore Ferragamo passed away. And again, learned a tremendous amount about the European way of, of working with fashion. And I, I loved my experience there. They were wonderful people. But I really um, was working for a while. I was getting up there and I really wanted to have a family. And so I decided to take a, 
a medical leave of absence. Um, and I actually, doctors, the doctor required me to take one and I did have my baby. I got someone else I worked with at Calvin Klein to move into my spot. So, cause I didn't want to leave them in the lurch. And um, I had my daughter and when she was around six months, I was standing in Bloomingdale's and I couldn't find anything I liked. And I all of a sudden came up with an idea of what I wanted to do um, for an apparel line for kids. And that night I, I, this is really the funny story. I was taking a shower in the shower. I came up with the whole concept of how I was going to present it to factories and buyers and the whole thing. And it, it really was, um, it, you, you couldn't do this now because it, it was really huge laminated dolls with apparel on it that people can like, you know, take off and on. And the buyers loved it. It was like playing with color forms and it was just a creative way of doing it. I got a factory to make samples for me. And, um, and then it was time to decide what type of company to go with, whether to go with a big children's wear company and we would become just another notch on their belt or to go with a, a company that was in the women's uh, apparel that wanted to get into kids. This was okay. all before everybody got into kids. Sorry. Okay. So let's step back for a minute because what I love about this is you had an aha moment that you probably never expected to. And it was an opportunity that you saw. And this is where entrepreneurship comes in. And you're like, I can't find anything. Well, I'll just create it myself. And it's like, okay, let's just create it. You don't even know what you're getting into, but this is how entrepreneurship works. You saw a need for yourself, but you're probably thinking everybody else is maybe thinking like this too. They can't find anything cute and you went for it. And you left corporate America to start your own production company, just like I did, right? Ugh. Hard. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the thing is, you don't know what you don't know. So you didn't know you were walking into this mammoth experience. Yep. And again, just like anything else, I, I always say that my whole career has been a product of my experiences. And one thing took me to the next. And because I built relationships at Calvin Klein, I was able to get them you know, management and C-suite executives at the retail of retail operations to purchase Ferragamo because they were starting, you know, to um, enhance their women's division. I then contacted them again when I started my kids clothing company and asked them if I could have a shot and if they would, you know, look at it. And so we wound up being in Neiman Marcus and Bloomingdale's and I Magnin and Stanley Korshak in um, in Texas. And it, it, it was amazing. Um, this is amazing because, well, one, I think your background helped tremendously with this and you did have connections and good connections. But I have to tell you that that's like a huge huge thing to see like your creation in Neiman Marcus. Like, really? I mean, talk about like, kudos to you. This is like, unbelievable. I, I just love this. But I do want to know, was there was there like a bump in the road that made that part difficult? Or was that like easy? Like, I'd like to know what your greatest challenge was in doing this and how you overcame it. Well, there were there was there were several. Um, <laughs> you know, the thing the thing the thing was, and I know that um, we're going to be talking about this on Monday. But the whole point of um, you know registering a trademark for your brand, okay? Yes. Um, the name of the company when we started the concept was Head to Toe, and mm -hmm. we had the labels and the hang tags and everything else. And we found out two weeks before we were launching. Someone had went in and applied for the name in the apparel industry, not necessarily kids, but in apparel. And so we couldn't use the name. And yep. so we had to quickly. Um, so that was the first thing. So we had to quickly change everything around and we called it mixed pieces because that's really what it was. It was tops, bottoms, 
with a hat and a pair of socks all put together as one SKU. It was easy for buyers. It was easy for the consumer. And actually, it was a, it was a real fitting name. And um, I mean, I still have the apparel, you know, of course my you daughter, do. <laughs> pardon? Of course you do. Of course I do. <laughs> and my daughter was a very well-dressed little, um, little baby at the time. Um, so that was the first thing. The second thing was we were, we made the decision to go into business with, um, as I said, a, a company that was in women's and they wanted to get into kids. The challenge was that we were working with factories in Turkey at the time, and they didn't know how to put a gripper, you know, for a one piece onesie for an infant on the garments. We had to send the snaps and the machinery from the U.S. to Turkey, you know, and you're dealing with um, infant clothing. So this cannot fall off. You know what I'm saying? It yes. would be, you know, it would jeopardize, let's put it that way, and have huge lawsuits. So that was another challenge. And um, and then, you know, it, we there was a situation um, in dealing with partners that, you know, all I can say is you need to know their strengths and weaknesses a lot more before you sign the contract. That's, that, that's as much as I'm going to say in that. that Okay, so that is jam packed with great advice. First, everybody, your business could actually be derailed before you ever, um, ever launch it because you don't get a trademark. And this is something that I'll be going in depth with on Clubhouse on Monday at four o'clock with the two with two of us, because we both have experience in this and it is not fun. So I mm -hmm. say to people, if you never thought about trademarking something, it should be like one of the first things because you just explained how you had to scramble and it sets you back time and money because people will take it. If you have a good creative name, if they get even an inkling about it, people will take it. Then the second thing is that I love about this is you got to go in business with people who know something <laughs> about the industry you're in, right? Or else you're spending so much time back you know, backwards trying to educate people or teach people. Um, but yeah. that's weird. That was, that was a, that was a decision that in hindsight um, probably could have gone in a different direction if we went with a major children's wear manufacturer. Um, and we were speaking to both. But it was like, you know, they had so many name brand companies. We felt we would just be one more, like, as I say, notch on their belt. We wouldn't have the, you know, they wouldn't give us the time and the attention that we needed to launch it as well as we wanted to. So we decided to go with someone who was hungry to get into kids. And they were a, a well-known um, women's wear um, and apparel manufacturer. I mean, they were, they were a good company. But, you know, again, you don't know what you don't know. And exactly. so there were a lot of things they, they didn't know. <laughs> so what happened to this company? Well, um, there were some internal things that created a situation where um, I had to walk away. Mm. And my I had gotten very... Another thing that you need to keep in mind is having a good attorney okay? oh, yeah. oh, when, yeah. when you start this, because I was given instructions by an attorney um, because I was getting so much stress from these people every time I went into the office and they had broken the contract um, with my with my ex-husband at the time. And. Um, it was a very stressful situation because I'd go home and he'd want to sue them and I'd go to the office and they wanted me to stay, but they were threatening me if he sued them. So I, I really, it was, it was totally stressful. And so the attorney said, pack up what you need, walk out during lunch and don't go back. The only thing he did not say was if I did that, I would get Zippo oh. of my contract. So you basically forfeited the right to a company you started 
mm -hmm. had the idea, built it from the ground up, launched it. And so <laughs> this breaks my heart. It really does. But I have to say it happens more often than I think people realize. And they do have these, these horror stories. And and it does. It, it breaks my heart because I see entrepreneurs struggle with this. And they do have to walk away. And they lose a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I'll lose the rights to, to what they've created. And I think you gave good advice here. The attorney is critical. So do your due diligence and maybe reach out to people who have used them. And, and if this is the right, the right person who knows something, but the one thing you did business with family and a lot of people will go into business with friends and with family. And it seems like the contracts you may have had were not as in depth or fair or however that was written. And, and I think this is a huge lesson, Donna, that unfortunately I had to go through, but for people out there who are entering into contracts, well, first off, here's mine. Don't ever enter in a contract with a friend or a family member. <laughs> that's like, that's rule number one. Yeah, that, that, that would but, definitely be in my vocabulary. Now. Exactly. Exactly. I don't care how good they are. I don't care how in love you are with them. I, I don't care how much money they're bringing to the table find a way to be with yourself or maybe an investor or maybe another partner. But then if you're going to do that, everything has to have a contract like airtight because I, I'm sorry that that happened to you because I bet that the clothes and everything was just beautiful and you filled a need. And oh, it so was, it was, I mean, it, the thing about being a Neiman Marcus was terrific, but to be back in Bloomingdale's and oh. in Bloomingdale's and seeing that there that was that was the thing that was most exciting and it was you know it, it was a time when um um this was probably my my ex-husband and my my our first venture you know like that we were like really we sucked so much time into this thing you know mm -hmm. and it was the time of no computers so when you're making spreadsheets and a business plan and you make a mistake you got to do it all over again. <laughs> there was, there were no, you know, it was just, it was so much more challenging then. And the one thing that I, the, the one piece of advice that I like to give, and, and I love talking at the college level to graduating um, students. And I've done this at uh, Texas Tech and I've done it at SMU. Um, and it's different now because we had COVID. But my, my advice is always, and everybody wanted to graduate and start their own business. And yeah. my advice was work for somebody else at least for a year and get experience and make a mistake on their dollar, not yeah. on your dollar, because mm -hmm. just doing that could just break you. And But now since COVID, I mean people don't have choices, you know? Um, and so a lot of businesses started um, yeah. due to that. And a lot of people have gone in and they've gone out. So um, I just feel that there's nothing like gaining experience from someone else. Well, you know, I talk and I say the same thing every single Thursday, 2,739 businesses went out today went out yesterday and that same number tomorrow. Everybody's hearing it out of my mouth right here live every single week because you just said, you know, 5 million new businesses came in, but we know how hard this is. And it's the one of the reasons why I team up with all of my, my rock star entrepreneurs is to be able to give you some insight as to how hard this is, but what to do right and what, what to do you know, what not to do. Um, so did this kill entrepreneurship for you completely? No. You're like, I'm done. I'm never, I'm never no, doing no. this again. It, but actually it gave me a lot of experience in children's wear. And I went back into corporate America. I went and got, I actually, you know, got went back into corporate America as director of marketing and licensing for a huge children's wear company that had the licenses for Eddie Bauer, New Balance, Major League Baseball, Laura Ashley, and I made more money than when I left. So it was a it was a great experience, but an opportunity came to move to Dallas. 
And it was an opportunity that uh, um, my significant other at the time thought that he had. And it turned out that it didn't happen the way that he had thought. And so I didn't have any thought of going back to work right away. I wanted to get my daughter settled. She was going into high school and she turned to me after two um, weeks and said, you know, mom, I love my life here. I wish we lived here my whole life. So I was thrilled, but there was no choice for me to move back to New York. I mean, I was not going to do that again to her. So I had to come up with something and I thought I was going to go back to corporate America because um, there was Match.com was here at the time and yeah. Fossil Fossil was here at the time. And I thought I'd like, you know, start to pursue, you know, major corporations. And then somebody said to me, Donnie, you got, you got out. Why do you want to go back in? And it's like that line from The Godfather, you know, just when I got out, they <laughs> dragged me back in. <laughs> So um, and um, and somebody mentioned, you know, promotional products to me. And, you know, I had this like <laughs> these visions of like the sleazy salesman and the pens that break and, you know, cheap T-shirts. And, you know, I was coming off of, you know, working for the Ferragamos. There were frescoes on the walls and ceiling in their <laughs> palazzo in Florence. You were not going into cheap T-shirts. No, like, no, no, right? no. I could not. I could not. And so I thought about if if I could if I could turn it around a little bit and create something that was more on my taste level and the brands that I worked for, then I would. But again, I didn't take the easy route because I moved to Dallas. I didn't know a soul. I went into a brand new industry and I um, did it 180 degrees different than everybody else because everybody else would pick up this mug and they would call all their clients, make tons of money. I mean, but that's not who I am. You know, I had I, there was nobody I could call. So I had to come up with a different way of starting this business. And it was, I took what I learned, which was how to build relationships. And I found that I would go to networking meetings. I'd have one-on-ones. I talked to people and I would give them a gift and I would thank them for meeting with me. And what I did was my mental Rolodex was constantly going off. And I was trying to think, who can I, who can I introduce them to? Because if I didn't need their product and service, I must know someone that I could connect them with. And so I wound up just thanking them and I would give them things, not necessarily expensive, but different things that were coming out to the marketplace. And I found that they would either want to purchase those things for their own company or they would refer business to me. And so that's how I built my present company. I mean, I'm now living in Dallas 17 years. My company is 15 years old. And that's that's how I built it because I there was nobody I could call to to sell a mug to. So I I had to come up with a different route. And it was more it was more of who I was. I I, I'm about building relationships. I'm about, you know, creating um you know, showing appreciation, saying thank you and and doing it that way um, and giving. You know, I always say give value first. Um, and I really hate, you know, I, I really hate the hard selling because I can't do it. My daughter is phenomenal at selling. My <laughs> yeah. ex-husband is phenomenal at selling. It's just not my thing. So um, I, I just like it, it's that difference between the microwave oven and the crock pot. I am definitely more a crock pot. You just gave so much good advice. Like, I hope people are listening to this right now. For me, I love when somebody differentiates themselves. You were authentic and true to yourself. You didn't want to be like anybody else, but that's the big differentiator. There were a million of the others doing the cheesy pens. But you're like, that's not who I am. I'm going to bring a different concept. And that's entrepreneurship. I mean, it's harder because mm-hmm. it's like the need behind the need. Nobody knows they need until exactly. Donna's going to come around and like shake it up. So it is much harder in uncharted territory. And But think about how pioneering and creative you are, Donna. I mean, like I'm so 
I'm so in awe. I'm so impressed. <laughs> like when I, I told you guys out there, this is rock star territory. Like I'm not bringing you people who do not know anything. Take their advice. Um, so tell people right now, um, you know, I, I know I, I call you a giveologist. Well, actually, you are a giveologist. And so can you explain, you know, what that term is and um, how you can help people with your company? I, you know, I, as I said, I, I love to give. I love to give value first, whether it was connecting people or giving them an, a gift. And I have found that I've gotten so into the whole gift giving phenomenon that it's not just about the gift. Okay. I always say it doesn't have to be a tangible gift. It could be a thank you note. It yeah. could be, you know, um, a compliment. It could be you have a client that is very um, involved in a, a nonprofit organization and you volunteer, you know, so it could be any different thing. I just happen to have a business that does corporate gifts. So for me, it was an easy thing to, you know, utilize. But, um, you know, but I still will go to eBay or I would go to, you know, Etsy if I think there's something better that I could recommend to a client that then I could provide for them. So it's to me, it's just about giving. And so I just, you know, came up with like, you know, I, I, I actually really, you know, spend my time with a circle of giveologists because it yeah. seems to be a common thread with the people that um, have been attracted or I've been attracted to in the business world. You know, I had a summit last August with 10 leading experts in different industries. Everyone was in a different industry, but the common thread was they all had a unique way of showing client appreciation. And that could be from taking clients to the Kentucky Derby to having, you know, a, a big event at, you know, like a big movie theater and renting it out and having a party. It could be so many different things. And so I, I tend to gravitate towards people like that and um, which makes it so much nicer because everybody understands the concept of what it means to give. Right. I love it. And you are the top giveologist because <laughs> never, ever would I ever buy another pen again for anything. And I learned that from you. Uh, so I, I think it's amazing. And I have to tell you, I have received your gifts and they are so very classy, beautifully packaged. And for those of you out there, go the extra mile, because I think that that can make a difference. Even if it isn't super expensive inside, it looks just so beautiful. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it became so much a part of me, Maureen, that I did create a course, you know, of, of helping people and teaching people how to give so that, you know, I always say, I want my clients to experience the same thing I experience when I give a gift, like you just, you know, gave me a compliment about the gift. That's what I want for my clients. I want them to, to the, I want their clients to know the value that they yeah. bring to that relationship and, yeah. and experience how good it feels when someone, you know, appreciates what you gave them. And it's really about them and with no strings attached. So if people would like to take this course, how do they get a hold of you? How, you know, where do they reach out to you? Well, um, they can reach out to me via email, Donna at Donnaco.com. I am on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, and I'm in Clubhouse. Yeah. And um, my website is Donnaco.com. So if you could just Google me, I, you could find me. But, yes. Um, yes. you know, and I'd be happy to, you know, talk to people and explain to them more about the whole philosophy and how it's helped my clients increase their business. That's great. Oh my gosh. We are, literally, I could talk to you all day, but we are literally at the halfway mark. And I always say to people out there, this is jam packed for 30 minutes. I hope everybody was taking notes. 
If not, I will be putting out a replay. It'll be on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook. It'll be on LinkedIn. Check out Donna's social media because she will have it too, uh, especially if you didn't catch everything. But Donna, you are a true rock star. I am you know, very honored to be in your presence as a business person and as a friend. But you know, when I surround myself, myself with other entrepreneurs, um, I, I learned so much about their journey, but I also learned how they can help me in my business because we're always growing. And I have to tell you, since I've met you, I have learned so much about this partnership building through this, this very, I think, unique process that I think anybody can incorporate. And if they have more questions, everybody out there, please reach out to Donna. So thank you very much for tonight. Green, thank you. And I just have to add one thing that you are an amazing, amazing business person. And the amount of information that you share with everybody, um, I have learned so much. So the feeling is quite mutual. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Now for everybody who is tuning in next Thursday. All right. I have to say we're all over the globe, but we will finally have a male entrepreneur on here. Donna, it has been nothing but female entrepreneurs, which I have adored every single conversation with everybody, but I feel like we need to mix it up and talk about, you know, men and their entrepreneurial journey. Sometimes it's a little bit different. So we're going to mix it up a little bit. And it is somebody international too, because we are all over the globe. So we'll see everybody next Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Donna, Thank you very much. Thank Good night, you, everybody. Bye-bye.